The Eternal Priesthood. Today we're going to be looking at some insights into Phineas, uh, once again, Pincus, as it's referred to in the scriptures. Looking at our uh, our parasha of Pincus, just wanted to share some insights, some things we didn't get to yesterday when we were talking about uh, the, the zeal of Pincus, um, his nature, what makes him special, what makes him a... a uh, you know, blessed character and in, in the in the scriptures and so forth. And I mentioned also yesterday about how Pincus is, in fact, Elijah. And we'll be talking about that, uh, sharing him insights as, as well and some other things. So welcome. Good morning. Glad you're here. Please be sure and like this video and uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, Eliezer, good to see that you guys made it back to Florida. Come back uh, as soon as you can. <laughs> we loved having you here. It was really a blessing. Uh, happy 4th of July to everybody. For those of you who are Lapidniks in the United States, um, happy 4th of July. This is our Independence Day. And it is a, you know, it's a fun day. For those of you who do, because we have a, a large, uh, you know, community outside of the United States. Thank God for that. It's a really, you know, Lapid's really a miracle, but I, I, I can't. I want time to get off on that right now. Uh, but in any case, uh, for those of you outside the United States, wondering what we do here in Los Estados Unidos for our uh, celebration. So uh, what are some traditions we do for Independence Day? Of course, we have uh, the, the stars, the Star Spangled Banner, um, the stars and stripes, we call it, our American flag flying everywhere. Uh, we, yes, barbecue, that is really the number one thing we barbecue, we gather with friends and family. And of course we have fireworks and, uh, it sounds, you know, and it's not just on the 4th of July. So usually it starts like July 1st <laughs> in goes, goes sometimes past July 4th, but, uh, it, it, it pretty much sounds like world war three, uh, in the neighborhoods around here because every single night. Uh, there are fireworks displays, not just by uh, major en entities like like city governments and so forth, uh, but also by private individuals. So, um, yeah, so it's barbecue. It's, uh, you know, outdoor family. It's uh, fireworks. Uh, for some people, it might be watching some good, you know, um, War movies, patriotic movies, that type of thing, uh, you know, maybe uh, in some cases. So, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, so happy Fourth of July. Also, this happens to be the anniversary of uh, for me and Rebbe Team. So we got married years ago today on the Fourth of July. Can you believe that? So 28 years. So happy anniversary to the Reb scene. She deserves a medal for being with me. And so, uh, yeah, so 28 years ago today, the 4th of July, I decided to get married on Independence Day because that's just how I roll. And so, uh, yeah, so it was pretty, pretty neat, huh? So, um, sorry, Eliezer. I don't know why we didn't let you guys know. I, <laughs> we just, the 4th of July, uh, so our works this evening for Rebbe Zim. So you're welcome. So yeah, 28, uh, 28 years and a couple of years will be 30 years, which is crazy. But yeah. So, hey, listen, a couple of quick things about the 4th of July and Jews. Um, uh, just a couple of quick, quick things that might be of interest to you. Some of you already know this, um, but there is a connection to Jews and the independence of the United States. In fact, very big very big things. Uh, there's a man by the name of Haim Solomon. Some of you may have heard his name before. Um, he was born in 1740. He died in 1785. And he was a Polish Jew. Uh, and he was a, uh, he was a broker, a financier, uh, very patriotic to the United States or, or the, the colonial uh, patriots, as, as they were called back then. Um he was captured by the British on a couple of occasions. And while he was being captured, he actually spoke fluent German and fluent French. And so the British had hired uh, uh, German mercenaries, uh, Hessians, uh, to come and fight 
uh, the colonials. And he uh, worked to try to talk to those German soldiers uh, and get them to defect and become uh, patriots. I'm not sure how effective that was, but he, in fact, uh, did that. And because he spoke fluent French, he also worked with um, uh, on behalf of the colonial army to encourage the French uh, to join the war. And in fact, they did join the war. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to win the war. Had it not been for uh, the French involvement, particularly their Navy, we would not have been able to do that. But he also financed the colonial army. Uh, when I say finance, we're talking about 17, the 1770s, okay, the late 1770s. And he provided the colonial army six hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars i have no idea what that would be in modern currency but it, it, it's going to be a lot um i can't imagine six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in 1776 or 1778 uh so basically heim solomon is credited with saving the colonial army by the way of finance he basically funded the Revolutionary War on behalf of what would become the United States. So the United States very much owes its existence to a Polish Jew named Heim Solomon. But he wasn't the only one. There were also Dutch Jews on the island of St. Saint, uh, Saint Estatius. Um, I think I pronounced that correctly. And they were responsible for basically running the blockade and supplying the colonial army with munitions and all kinds of other supplies until the British sent a fleet there to basically conquer that island and, and expel the Jews of St. Estatius. Um, and therefore they could no longer supply the colonial army. They are credited. Uh, the first synagogue there, by the way, was built in 1739. It was, they were Dutch Jews. I'm not sure if I mentioned that or not, but they were Dutch Jews and they're credited with, uh, you know, again, supplying the colonial army, which is a huge, you know, if your army doesn't have supplies, then it can't fight. Now, they were eventually sacked by the British fleet, uh, and the Brits um, proceeded to basically loot the entire island. What's interesting about this, though, is that while that kind of quash put, put the kibosh on the Jews, Jewish people of that island being able to supply the colonial army, um, it also had the effect of distracting the Jewish, or excuse me, the English Navy. And so while the English were taking care of the island of St. Estatius and stopping that trade and, and basically getting carried away, looting the island, uh, meanwhile, the French fleet was sailing to the United States coast and General Cornwallis at Yorktown was basically um, defeated because the French got there and he had no, uh, su no no support because the British Navy was busy trying to stop the Jews from supplying the, the colonial army. So in a roundabout way, uh, them uh, being stopped also allowed the French to um, come in and basically Cornwallis subsequently uh, was defeated. So Ain Ode Milvado. And one final thing, um, Benjamin Franklin introduced when it, when it came time to try to create a seal, uh, a, the great seal uh, for the United States. Um, it was interesting because there was several, you know, options. Uh, of course, the great seal of the United States now is the eagle and the shield. And the eagle has in one talon has a, a bunch of arrows, which represents our ability to make war and our willingness to do so. And the other talon is an olive branch, which represents our desire for peace. And so the head of the eagle in the United States seal is the head of the eagle is turned towards the talon that has the olive branch. And the, the symbolism there is that we prefer peace. We want peace. However, we do have the power uh, and, and the will um, hopefully we still have it, uh, to make war if, if, if we need to. But we are a nation who desires peace. That's our current seal. That's the great seal of the United States. And there are, um, there are stars around it and so forth. Now, the, the one introduced, however, by um, 
uh, Benjamin Franklin was actually very interesting because it was a artistic depiction of the Egyptian army being drowned at the Red Sea with Moses and the people standing on one side of the shore and the Egyptians being drowned in the water and then the, the pillar of cloud by day, by day and the pillar of fire by night uh, kind of hovering over the water. And the inscription, I, I think I may mess this up, but it says something to the effect of uh, uh, resisting tyrants as obedience to God. I may have, I may have uh, not said that exactly this, the, the right way, but that's, that was written on the outside. And it was very interesting. There was another depiction, there was another rendition of it, of, of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. But it's interesting to me that in those early days of trying to figure out what our seal was going to be, we were going back to the book of Exodus and looking at depictions there. So just some biblical history there to the start of our country. Um, clearly, the United States has gotten away from that, which is unfortunate clearly, but that's, then again, that's why we exist. So, um, so the Jewish people basically are responsible for freedom in, in the United States and, and, and to that extent and large parts of the world. So you're welcome. All right. So Phineas, son of, son of Aaron, the Midrash says that Phineas, uh, that when the divine glory was with him, he was like an angel of Hashem. This is Leviticus Rabbah. Um, However, even though he was beloved by Hashem among men, he had many enemies who would have banished him had the Holy Spirit not been upon him. For example, some reproached him for acting without the approval of the sages from Talmud, Yerushalayim, and Sanhedrin, and the Mishnah Sanhedrin 9-7. You know, it's interesting to me because when you have people, and this is so common, we've been talking about David, right? We talked about David being anointed. Uh, the, the stone the builders rejected, that was a drosh we had two weeks ago. Uh, this last week, we had the story of David and Goliath. And what we see there with David is that David is clearly God's man. I mean, you know, is that disputable today? No. But yet when David was alive, no, he was rejected as king. I, I won't say that no one followed him, but the vast majority of people did not believe in him, did not follow him. The same thing is true for Phineas. We look at Phineas, he's clearly a hero, he's clearly a zealot, he be, he is Elijah, and so, uh, you know, is this a man of God? Well, yes, but it's interesting to me that in his day, people rejected him. You know, it's, it's fascinating, and this is where you and I have to be so, so careful, because uh, it's, it's a common phenomenon that people will reject the things of God. So we can't be caught up in, well, is this popular? You know, it's 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 really it's really a catch twenty two. Because I guess the bottom line is, you know, truth doesn't often win the popularity contest. Would you agree with me? Would you agree that truth doesn't necessarily always win the popularity pageant? And yet, that's what people look for. They look for, you know. Is this popular? Is it well accepted? I mean, we've talked about this at length in the time in times past, but let's just be clear, shall we? Every single redeemer that you that, that the Jewish people have ever had, and and specifically, I'm thinking about Moses and 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 uh, um, uh, Joseph. I'm sorry, so I went blank there for a second. Joseph, Moses, and then King David. OK, you can even throw in Ezra and Nehemiah. That every single redeemer that we've had, none of them have won the popularity contest. Moses, or excuse me, uh, Joseph was rejected by all of his brothers and including his father. They rejected him. They rejected his dreams. They, they laughed and mocked at him and, and, and tried to kill him. Moses was rejected. They said, are you, are you the boss of me? I mean, we, you know, get out of here. The reason that Moses, remember, the reason that Moses was, was kicked out of Egypt and cast into the wilderness for 40 years was the, his people's fault. It was the Jewish people's fault. They rejected him. They outed him. 
And as a result, he was kicked out. It's all, it was all their fault. We rejected Joseph, and yet he was the redeemer. We rejected Moses, and yet he was the redeemer. King David, same thing. We rejected David, yet he was the redeemer. So you see, when people say, well, every all the Jewish people reject Yeshua, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, <laughs> actually, that's actually a, a good sign, actually. When people say that to me, I'm like, uh, you know, Jewish people say, well, all, all, all the people reject Yeshua. It's like, yeah, well, actually, that puts him in the category of he's probably the right, he's probably the redeemer, because we have a a track record of rejecting our redeemers. Ezra and Nehemiah, how, why did I bring them up? Well, because they took a fraction of the people out of Babylon and brought them back to Jerusalem. The vast majority of people, the Jewish people, remained in Babylon, which is why Babylon. Uh, remained a a strong Jewish hub to the extent that we have the Babylonian Talmud, Talmud. No, the Babylonian Talmud doesn't mean that it's it's Babylonian in its origin and 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 is full of incantations and magic spells. I roll, sty, please stop. It's just the fact that there were so many Jews in Babylon. It'd be like saying that uh, you know there's the Brooklyn Talmud today if 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 it was such a thing, right? Because there's so many Jews in Brooklyn. That's all. It doesn't mean, have anything to do with Brooklyn, just the location. So the point being, though, is that Ezra and Nehemiah brought people out of out of uh, Babylon and brought them back to rebuild Jerusalem in the Second Temple. But guys, it was it was a it was a very very small crowd. So generally speaking, what does that mean, by the way? Well, it means that people rejected Ezra and Nehemiah as redeemers did that were they doing god's will of course so look truth <clears throat> rarely wins the popularity contest does that mean that we uh we shouldn't you know be concerned if uh you know if we have uh, a trickle of people no we need to pray that people would that hashem would send the breakthrough absolutely at the same time that can't be our focus we can't say well you know uh, we, since we don't have 20,000 people coming here, then it must we must be doing something wrong. Um, that's not, you know, I mean, who was it that said that broad is the way to destruction and narrow is the way to life? I, that's That seems vague in my mind. But that was something that was said, right? So the people rejected Phineas. And then, listen, I mean, he goes in there. He takes matters into his own hands. He runs uh, this couple through with a spear which is, you know, sometimes we got to look at these biblical stories and just kind of go back and put ourselves there. That's, can you just imagine, you got two human beings and you're running both of them through with a spear. You know, that's, this is some serious stuff. Uh, anyway, I digress, but look, all the, and as a result of this, the plague stops. And um, and then the people start griping. Well, Phineas should have done that. He should have he should have gotten Moses's permission first. He should have gotten the Sanhedrin's permission first. What now? It, 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 people are are accusing uh, Phineas of not even not even being legitimate. And so Hashem has to step in and give him an eternal priesthood just to prove that what he did was right. What's the point? The point is, guys, there were, listen, Joseph had his detractors. Moses had his detractors. Phineas had his detractors. Aaron has his detractors. These are people that are called of God. And yet people are like, who are they? Who put them in charge? They're self-appointed. They, they're out for themselves. They accuse Moses of sexual immorality that he never did. Uh, hello. They they accused Aaron of stealing money, being being uh, being loosey goosey with the finances, and and and, and basically uh, engendering himself with the money. Uh, hello. They accused uh, you know Joseph of being uh, power hungry and had a just wanted was they accused him of being arrogant and just uh, mean and just wanting all the glory for himself. Uh, Hello. I mean, guys, you see, there's nothing new under the sun. 
This is why our standard has to be Torah. We have to go, and we can't have these fantasies. They accuse David of being uh, a, an arrogant like uh, uh, illegitimate son. If anything got was stolen in the in the town, they blame David. I mean, there was there were there were websites dedicated to these guys trying to make them look bad. I mean, really. But I, I'm quite obviously I'm kidding. But in a modern times, that's exactly what will be going on. That's why this is so important. And what in Yeshua, you know, we're, think about all the negative things that have been said about Yeshua, and and yet we're supposed to go by that. No, we look at we. This is why history matters. You know, the reason I love history so much uh, is because it's so important. It is critical. It's critical that we understand history, that we understand how we got here. And we because you go back, listen, how many people know? Ask yourself, you tell me this answer. How many people do you know know that David, when he was anointed king, or even before that, and, and even after that, that he was rejected, that everybody pretty much hated his guts and didn't want anything to do with it? How many, how many of you know that? How many of you know people that know that? No, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to guess. This is my theory. My theory is that most people have no clue. They think that once he was an honored king, everybody was like, yay, David. We can't wait for you to replace Saul. Is that what happened historically? No, he was rejected. David was rejected right up until the time that basically he died. There were people that mocked him for the Bathsheba thing up until his death. There's people who mocked him after his death. How many people do you know have given thought to the fact that everybody rejected Joseph? How many people do you know have, have are even aware that it's the Jewish people who rejected Moses? So when the Jews reject their Redeemer, that's actually a sign that the guy is the real redeemer actually it says eventually Phineas went on to use his authority to promote reconciliation among the tribes in two instances when Reuben Gad and a part of the tribe of Manashe were in disagreement with the rest of the tribes in Joshua 22 and later, when an argument broke out between the tribe of Benjamin and the remainder of the nation in Judges 21, the Midrash teaches that the model for Phineas was the patriarch Isaac. The only numerical value of their names are, excuse me, the, the numerical value of their names are equal, which is 208. And they were alike, not only physically, but spiritually. Like Isaac, Phineas had the same uh, principle of strict justice. Phineas, like Isaac, was a zealot, but he went further than his predecessor and filled a void that Isaac had left. To be sure, Phineas too was ready to be sacrificed on the holy altar, but what is more, he did not hesitate to kill out of love of Hashem. It's interesting to me that Phineas is linked to to Isaac, just like Yeshua is linked to Isaac. What's also interesting about Phineas is Phineas became what was known as the priest anointed for war, meaning that he was the one that went out and anointed the army before it went into battle. He and and the priest anointed for war was essentially the deputy high priest. More importantly, in mystic lore or mystic teachings of Judaism, the priest anointed for war is one of the four listed as one of the, the four craftsmen. And it's almost like a euphemism for the Messiah. Now, keep in mind that Phineas is also Elijah. So there's all this connection. He's a priest anointed for war, which is one of the four craftsmen. He's Elijah. He's connected to Isaac. And ultimately, his life is about self-sacrifice. He's the son of Eliezer, it says. The Torah enumerating the genealogy of the Israelites notes that Eliezer married a daughter of Putiel, who bore him Phineas. 
It then concludes in the same in the same verse. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Exodus six twenty five. The Zohar remarks that the plural form is used despite the fact that Phineas was the only son of Eliezer, because in Phineas were the souls of of uh, Nadav and Avihu, according to this mystical teaching. It goes on to say the son of Aaron the Cohen, Aaron the first Cohen Gadol, was the grandfather of Phineas. Aaron was known for his love of peace and for uh, and for all uh, always finding a way to reconcile staunch enemies. In the Mishnah Avot one twelve, he is pointed to as the epitome of the one who loves peace and seeks peace. His grandson Phineas was on the opposite extreme. He was a zealot whose example prompted people to call Kohanim quarrelsome. So it goes on to say in this commentary by Rabbi Monk, um, it's very difficult to bring these two contradictory types of character into harmony. Totefot to the Tamil Zevakim 101b points out that Phineas was not accepted by the people until he was able to bring peace to all the tribes in Judges 21.9. Only then were all his qualities acknowledged. However, his great victory was that his offspring would eventually be appointed to the position of Kohen Gadol, a calling that is, is inspired by Midat HaHesed, the principle of love. That enabled him to combine within himself, even now, the principle of justice with the principle of love. So it says, how can we define the role of a zealot? Because that is what um, Phineas is. Phineas is a zealot. He has an immense zeal for God. And so this insight from Rabbi Bunk says, how can we define the role of a zealot? A case requiring zealous action like that of Phineas cannot be brought forward to the court for judgment. For a human court cannot order the death penalty in the absence of properly formed warnings by the witnesses. It is then that the zealot comes onto the scene and through his courage and devotion to Hashem, he carries out an action that the great sages and judges did not have the right to command. Then the zealot's special time has come. The exact qualities of a zealot are described in detail by Rambam in Hilakot Isure Bia. What it's talking about here is, in as much as we talked about yesterday, the court was just standing by the entrance to the meeting. They were powerless to act. And they're powerless to act because they don't have the authority to act. They can't put Zimbre to death because he's consorting with this Moabite woman because they don't have enough, they don't have the proper due process. This is where Phineas comes in. He's a zealot for God. He recognizes there's a, there, there's a need here to act outside the realm of halacha because in this case what this brazen man was doing was causing harm to the community significant harm goes on to say however the acts of a zealot are not free of criticism some of our sages argue that the prophet elijah and phineas were actually the same person but that the Shekinah had deserted him during the four generations up to the time of King Ahab when he became known as Elijah. This is in the Talmud Baba, 121a and Baba Metzia 114a, as well as the Midrash Shmuel 102. The Midrash relates that when Elijah escaped from the land of Israel because of King Ahab's persecution, Hashem appeared to him. In response to Hashem's query, Elijah explained, I avenged you because your children forsook your covenant. Biruteka, that is your bris, referring to the circumcision. Hashem then criticized Elijah's tendency to get carried away with vengeance. This now having twice, once when he was Phineas, and now when he's Elijah. In the future, Hashem said, Elijah's presence would be required at every circumcision of a Jewish child to prove to him that the Jews were not as wicked as he seemed to think. That is the reason for the tradition of the Kisei Shel Eliyahu, the throne of Elijah, 
in every circumcision ceremony. This is from Pirkei, the Rebbe Eliezer, chapter 47. So if you have ever been to a bris milam in which a baby boy on the eighth day is being circumcised, there is a chair set out. Sometimes it's a special chair designated for such said purpose. Sometimes it's just a chair. But in any case, it's referred to as the Kisei She'eliyahu. Traditionally, the um, Sandak sits on the chair. The Sandak is the, the man specially chosen by the father to hold the child while the child is being circumcised by the moil. And so tr by tradition, the Sandak sits in the Kisei Shel Eliyahu, the throne of Elijah, and he holds the baby boy as the moil is performing the bris milah. The reason for this is just, just what we read. The Kisei Shel Eliyahu represents the fact that Elijah is present at the bris milah of every Jewish boy so that he can be shown, of, like we just said, that the Jewish people are, are faithful. And that his, he was perhaps overzealous in certain instances. So it goes on to say, it is good to be strict zealous for oneself. Now, this is where you and I need to pay attention. What I'm about to read, people typically do the opposite. And what I mean by this is that usually we have all these strict standards. And we apply them to other people. And we're critical of other people. We criticize them. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. But we shouldn't do that. To our fellow Jew in our community, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. And we should give them leniency. On ourselves, however, we should be strict. Now, I caution us that in as much as we should be strict, don't get out of balance with that. Okay. Don't get overly self-critical. But the point being is that we should give others the benefit of the doubt and be more exacting with ourselves. People do the opposite of this to their own detriment. We criticize other people. You should have done that. You could have done that. I would have done that. And of course, the whole time, you're not doing any of it. Or you're pretending or lying to yourself, making think yourself... To, that you are doing, but you don't. And that's where we get in trouble. So it says, it's good to be strict zealot for oneself, but for the public good, one must be imbued with a chavat Israel, a love of Israel. That is a love for each and every Jew. Each and every Jew. Elijah was a zealot twice in his life, but for the remainder of his existence, he was filled with a love of Israel. And that will be his role at the end of days as a forerunner of the Messiah when he will bring together the hearts of the children and as well <clears throat> the, um, the hearts of their, of their fathers, okay? You know, in, in one final insight here, talking just talking about the nature of, of, uh, of Phineas, it says here that... Uh, just kind of in a mystical sense. I find this interesting as we look related back to the virgin birth of the Messiah. Did Messiah have a virgin birth? Was it a supernatural birth whereby um, uh, Miriam became pregnant, if you will, by the Ruach HaKodesh and as a result uh, did not have a, there wasn't a natural union between male and female. Is that is that a true thing? Yes, absolutely is. What? Isn't that pagan? No, it's not. In fact, um, this has happened before. It's called Adam. What? Why do you call Mother Earth Mother Earth? Because the Earth was Adam's mother. Was there a father? No, except for God. Point is, I brought this out before. I actually did a teaching on the channel here about the virgin birth and why it is, is, is absolutely necessary. It has to do with the fact of the original sin of Adam. If the Messiah is born of a natural birth, then he has he is unable to set us free of the poison of the snake. Don't have time to get into that right now, but just understand that that's a fact. But interestingly, we look at these kind of things. Sometimes you might say, well, that, if that's a pagan thing, the virgin birth. 
Remember this, ladies and gentlemen. The Satan can create nothing. The Satan is not a creator. He has no original ideas. This is very important. Please pay attention to what I'm saying here. Anything in paganism, the occult, whatever, we can never say that, well, we got that from paganism. Why? Because paganism, it comes from the Satan. All the false religions outside of Judaism, every single one is from the Satan. But you know why I say that? Because there's no other team. It's either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. There's no third player. What this means is, is that he, since he doesn't create, since he has no original ideas, every single thing in paganism is ultimately rooted in Judaism. What? Yes. Everything. The, what the Satan does is he perverts it. So we can't reject it and say, well, that's a pagan thought. God would never do that. Really? But I've covered this with respect to human offering. Human sacrifice is definitely pagan, definitely a cult. Who would do that? We don't throw blondes into volcanoes. God hates human sacrifice. And yet all of the sacrifices of the temple are based upon a human sacrifice. I've covered this at length with the sacrifice of Isaac. And yes, according to Judaism, he was sacrificed. And so therefore, every offering that's offered in the temple is offered on behalf or in, as a shadow Isaac. And then we get to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And what do we ask God to do? We ask God to make atonement for us based on what? Based on the offering of Isaac. And yet, human sacrifice is pagan, isn't it? Or is it? You see, everything in paganism, because the Satan has no new ideas, so we can't say the virgin birth comes from paganism. Can't say that. Why? Because the Satan doesn't make anything up. He is not a creator. He's He perverts things and twists things. Think about this. Why do you think the Satan is wanting so much? Because there are virgin births in, in so-called mythology, lots of them. So why do you think the Satan would want that to happen so much in his various religions? Because he wants to be like God. Why do you think he mimics that? Hello? So it says here, why do the sages use the expression Phineas is Elijah? which seems to imply that Phineas lived after Elijah rather than before him. <clears throat> the Zohar answers that Elijah was not a man born of a father and a mother, but an angel. Phineas is Elijah means that to archive so extraordinary an action of zealotry in the way that Phineas did, one has to have the spiritual strength of an angel. Whoever wants to take Phineas as a model must never forget that to exact Hashem's vengeance, one must have a soul as pure as, and as serene as an angel. What is this talking about? What are we talking about here? We're talking about that Elijah, who is Phineas, is a man, but not a product of an angel, or he is an angel, but he became a man and did his work here as a man. Yet he's born of, he's the son of Eliezer. What's this talking about? It's talking about, it's it look in in the Zohar we have with Elijah and Phineas this kind of it's a it's a divine being um, angelic being but yet human guys it's just a pattern there are things we don't understand and when it comes to Phineas there's great mysteries involved in that as well end of our aliyah today interesting stuff do we have all the answers no we don't but what we do know is that it's the fourth of July and we <laughs> wish you all. In the United States, a happy Independence Day. And so thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. So God bless all of you. Be safe. Enjoy your barbecue if you're here in Los Estados Unidos. Drink responsibly. And enjoy the fireworks. And we will see everybody tomorrow. Bezrat to Hashem. Until then, be blessed. Have a great and amazing day.